you guys for all being here. I'm going to take this mic off, probably, um, to learn about uh, the Funhouse remake. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, the history of the pinball company, why we took on the project um, before getting to that. L let me introduce my team here. Uh, my name is Nick Parks. I'm the founder of the pinball company. Uh, we've been operating uh, for 18 years now. And um, how long have you been with the company now? Four years. Four years. This is Dominic Kasich. Uh, he's the CF current CFO. He's the future CEO. Uh, he's just a younger version of me who is a much better pinball player. Um, probably the best hire that I've had to date. Um, he's super, a super smart guy. He was a practicing accountant when he joined the team, um, but his passion was in pinball, and I just thought it was a really good fit. He's done a really great job the last four years. And then Brian Allen, who I met at this uh, pinball show probably five or six years ago. If you've been by his booth or know about Brian, he is a brilliant artist. He, um, when I first saw his booth, I was impressed by his take on some of the Williams titles. So he has actually redone Medieval Madness, Monster Bash. I mean, so many different um, Williams titles, and it's just amazing artwork. And in my opinion, it's uh, some of these titles that didn't have, you know, very colorful art. It's uh, interesting to see his take, and it's more like you would imagine those games being made today. So um, he's, he's, he's great and been great to work with. You're going to see these slides going through. Um, some of the there's a set of slides that Brian supplied, and it's, you're kind of seeing him putting ink to paper or pen to iPad or what, however you use it um, to create this beautiful artwork uh, digitally. And then you're going to see some pictures that Dominic supplied, who's been uh, integral in um, kind of the quality control phase of when we started getting prototypes and like going through and fixing some of the issues. So you're going to see a white wood and, and some of the things we've been through. So. Um, <clears throat> So let me just briefly talk about um, the, the kind of the modern history of pinball. Some of you guys remember, you know, pinball going back to like alphanumeric displays and electromechanical. And when I started my website in 2006, it was like, no, we don't sell those machines. We only sell modern. And I had to identify what modern pinball was. And that was, you know, solid state, um, you know, games that were uh, using circuit boards and whatnot. And we kind of always said Funhouse. Funhouse from 1990 was always like when we said, hey, we saw modern pinball starting with 1990, and why we said 1990 was because we thought Funhouse was kind of like turning the page into some of the uh, modern features that you see at pinball today. Um, uh, uh, going back to 2006, um, I was 27 years old, um, recent graduate of, um, um, master, I got my master's degree in business at the University of Missouri, and my goal was to be a college professor. So I applied to great PhD programs. So it ultimately I would end up back at my alma mater and be a tenure professor. So I applied to like Northwestern, two, two schools here in Chicago, University of Chicago and Northwestern, some other great schools. And I didn't get into any of those. And so I had to think, what do I do with my life? So I, my buddy worked at a uh, game room retailer in St. Louis where they sold p pool tables, pinball machines, rugs, all that kind of stuff. And many people always ask me, how'd you get into pinball? You must love pinball. And I did always love pinball. I like playing pinball, but not to the degree that I wanted to begin in business. I just recognized that they sold so many pinball machines in that little corner of the store. And I reckon that who's selling, who sells pinball machines online? So to kind of get a discussion of modern pinball. If you go back to 2006, and I know uh, some of these guys had, had reached out to, who did I just talk to? Um, I'm losing my train of thought, but I asked Gary Stern if he would uh, sell me, if I could be a Stern distributor, because I thought there was a huge opportunity to sell pinball machines to homes. And he said, home sales of single digit percentages seemed like he didn't disagree. He's like, who are you? <laughs> um, and, and so the push, go back to 2006, the push on selling pinball machines was just put them in locations for people to play. Arcades, bowling alleys, and they were losing that fight. They've been losing that fight for a decade which is why Stern was the only manufacturer at that time. Um, is, and it was be getting beat out by video games and other modern era things that don't break as much, right? So I kind of thought I was onto something because I thought, well, that'd be cool to own a pinball machine. I think a lot of people, you know, who are, you know, have finished base basements would love to put a pinball machine in there. And so we quick, we, we came up with the name Pinball Company. We launched the website in 2006. Um, created a Google AdWords campaign, started advertising keywords like 
buy a pinball machine. And lo and behold, within months, we became the number one visited pinball website uh, focusing on selling pinball machines. Um, and our, our focus has always been um, over the last 18 years or what sets us apart is the fact that we refurbish used pinball machines and resell them for the home market. And we're still kind of a leader in that space because it's a very difficult space to operate in. You have to find technicians all across the country who will do work for your customers. And that takes time. And uh, now we have about 300 technicians that do service for our customers. And, um, you know, it's, but it is interesting to see where pinball has come from 2006 till now and how many pinball machines are now going directly from homes. And shows like this that are directed towards marketing pinball machines to people who are first time home buyers. And I like to think that we played a role in that. Um, Jersey Jack, pinballsales.com in, in 2004, there were other people around, but we're the ones that really put a bunch of money into marketing and trying to and cast a really big net and trying to get more people to the pinball market. So over the years, as we've been, um, you know, we, we sell Stearns now, you know, of course we've been selling Stearns since 2008. There's an interesting story. Should I tell that story? <laughs> Gary's not here. So, you know, Gary wouldn't sell me machines direct. So um, I, I made it a goal to go to the show and I brought my wife, Brooke, with me, and she's a very beautiful woman. So I, I walked her up to Gary Stern, and he had his nice, uh, you know, like, white Ray-Bans on. He was all spiffy. And I said, hey, Nick Parks, Pinball Company, this is my wife, Brooke. He kind of gave her this uh, little once-over, and boom, we were distributors. So um, I'm glad I did bring Brooke to the show, because I don't know if I'd become a distributor without her being there. So... Um, uh, and it's been it's been a good you know I've been to a lot of shows over the years and you kind of see the same people I haven't been to a show in four years but um, you see the same people they're just you know a little bit older uh, we have we definitely have our core community of people who who I see here um, in the pinball world but it's also great to see people um, new people to the pinball community so why Funhouse um, you know I thought remakes were brilliant when Doug Duba at Chicago Gaming decided he wanted to remake pinball machines I was like that's brilliant. Um, we're selling Medial Madnesses for $12,000, $15,000, dollars $20,000 for what we call high-end restorations. We rebuild to make them look new, which most people can't afford. And so when Chicago Gaming came out and they launched Medieval Madness at $79.99 for a brand new Medieval Madness, it was amazing. And they sold out that day. I don't know if people have been at that show. It was a pivotal day in, in remakes and saying, yes, people will buy old titles um, that had been remade, and, and just like they were. You don't have to make, change the technology at all. I mean, that wasn't their goal. They didn't have to change the artwork or anything. And uh, I think they underpriced it, but it also showed that there was a desire for some of these old 90 pin, 90s pins that honestly didn't get made enough. They didn't make enough to meet up with the current demand for pinball, at least at that, at that, at that point. So they made Monster Bash, and they did a great job on all those titles, but they didn't make some titles that I thought, hey, why don't they make these games too? And we've been selling pinball machines for many, many years. So we had a whole spreadsheet of how many machines we've sold, different titles, Adam's family, hundreds of them. And I think Funhouse, we probably sold over 100, maybe 200. I don't know. How many Funhouses are there? 20, uh, 10,000? Yeah. Uh, 11,000. 11, so it's one of the more popular by how many were made originally. Um, but we had already moved through, meaning we bought it, used, refurbished it, and sold it to a new home because there's people call us and say, hey, you got a Funhouse? They played Funhouse with their girlfriend at the local bowling alley, and that's the one that they wanted. We learned that very early on selling pinball machines, that you can have all these great pinball machines, but they want the one that they played with their girlfriend back in college or whatever. And Funhouse was one of those that always came up. It was a very iconic machine. I see you nudging him. You know, so you understand. You get, you get the whole thing. So, so we, we had to have Funhouse in stock almost all the time because it was one of those that was asked about so much and it's featured on desperate housewives in the creepy guy's basement uh, it was on the peach pit 90210 and we sold one to brian uh, brian austin green um that was really cool um it's it's one of those it's on, on, in the background of friends in the ping pong episode when they're playing ping pong and monica has the crazy hair that's a fun house in the background there's a couple others so i was like why is it being made so uh, honestly just reached out to rick uh who is the um claimed ownership of that license and I said okay you're the guy I want to work with and we and we worked a deal and um, uh, I wanted somebody to make it and you know Gary's not in the room Jack's not in the room um, you know I got turned down by some manufacturers who, who didn't think it was a good idea 
but ultimately we did find uh, a good manufacturing partner in, in Progetti in Italy, and, um, and they're doing a great job. You guys can go play the games out there at the booth, um, and they're holding up really well. It's beautiful artwork. Um, I, Brian was the guy I went to. Brian immediately was like, if someone's going to do this Funhouse artwork, it's, I'm, I'm, it's going to be Brian because he already likes remaking these Williams art, art pieces. So I uh, reached out to him. He was uh, open to doing it. And uh, then I had to convince Pedretti <laughs> to, to say, yes, he's the guy. I want to do it. It's now your game to manufacture. And, uh, and after they saw his artwork, they, they kind of agreed. So you can kind of see now we're kind of in the section where you see Brian's beautiful artwork. And it's so detailed. Back, you know, the original Funhouse artwork was just blue, yellow. It's like three, four colors, right? And that's, you know, look at a modern pinball machine. Uh, I, I always praise Jersey Jack for, you know, Wizard of Oz. And it was really like, wow, what, you, what could you do with an art package? And he led the way. And he showed Stern, which we told Stern because we had a lot of fluent customers, they will buy 10, 12, 15,000 of our machines. They're beautiful art pieces that they play. And um, Jersey, Jersey Jack proved that. And we were the first, uh, Pinball Company was the first U.S. distributor for Jack. I bought in right away, believing that pinball could be more than what was being produced. And got to thank Gary Stern for keeping pinball alive for all those years and, and for still, you know, staying at it. But I'm so glad that there has been more innovators into that into the manufacturing space because look at all the choices we have <laughs> just this year. Avatar and, I mean, there's there's a new title it seems like every month, which is I think is great for pinball. It makes it more competitive, but also... Uh, still good for pinball overall. Is it still cycling through, or did it stop? It stopped. Do I have to do something? I'm trying spacebar. Not working. Maybe, maybe it's going again. Let's see. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, you got. Hopefully, you guys saw it. Uh, <laughs> it's beautiful artwork, and we can. We try. While Brian is talking, I'll definitely try to. Um, show more of it, but um, the game is in production in Italy by Progetti. Um, they're doing a great job, um, very good quality. There has been uh, some hiccups. I imagine with every new pinball project, uh, you know, it doesn't come out the line or come out the prototypes don't come out exactly where you want it. And we've been pushing back really hard to make sure that those things get fixed. And every iteration is better and better. And I think the game is in its current state is great. Um, but I do want to bring Brian up just for a little bit about like some of the choices he made on the artwork. Um, and then for the Q&A, if there's questions about how, you know, certain things came to be or the quality control side of things, Dominic and, and Travis actually went to Italy for a week to sit, to, I mean, non, uh, the night and day work on issues that they saw. And it was a whole list spreadsheet of things that they wanted to see improved upon. So he's very knowledgeable on that side. So. Brian, you, you can stay seated if you want. Come on up. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm you can stay if you want. Uh, well, th thank you so much for bringing me on to the project. Um, and thank you, everybody in the room. Uh, everybody in the pinball community has been so supportive of my artwork. Uh, I came onto the scene here, I think, about maybe six years ago. I, I redid uh, the Monster Bash back glass. Um, I had always been a fan of, of pinball artwork and, and retro arcade artwork. And a friend of mine recommended that I do that. And then I linked up with um, uh, Rick at Planetary Pinball and just started remaking title after title of Williams Valley Games. And it, it, I, people just kept requesting new titles for me, and it just it, it grew into something that I, I just could never have planned for. Um, and I've been an artist full time uh, for about 20 years, um, independent for about 12 years. But having something like this, it, uh, uh, like a supportive community, really gives me and my wife a, a ton of freedom because I don't need to to work with. I can choose which clients I want to work with because I have the support of just awesome customers. So I just wanted to say thank you for that, um, and and thank you so much for for you know going with me on this on this pinball package because that's always been a bucket list thing for me uh, is to have something that that you can actually play. And Funhouse was perfect because it's one of the first machines I remember. And if you're familiar with my artwork, I've I like taking things that are supposed to be nice and cuddly and kind of making them, 
creepy. <laughs> and and Rudy, it, to me, is incredibly creepy. Um, and I think that's what makes him unique and cool um, and, and not so not so safe. Because to me, a fun house, at least my memories as a kid of going into a fun house, is just like very creepy, very on you know very edgy and uh y but but that's the fun of it you know um uh, there were a couple times where Padretti told me to make it make him less creepy so if if you think he's creepy now he actually was even creepier in earlier earlier drafts um if you can believe that but uh but a anyway um if just to say a little more about me i i've worked with um a lot of a lot of clients that I'm really proud of, like uh, I've done concert posters for Metallica. Um, I've worked with uh, Harley Davidson and Hulk Hogan. Um, I don't know if Hulk Hogan belongs in my top five anymore, but uh, it was fun at the time. Um, but other than that, I also just work with a lot of uh, just small businesses that, and just any opportunity that I can find to just, just draw what I love. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, and I hope to do more pinball machines with these guys in the future. I'll just I'll just piggyback on that. Um, another, if you go to his website, another thing you'll see, and I don't know if it's just a niche that you kind of got into by chance and uh, it's expanded upon, but like if you do a um, festival or a concert, um, cannabis festival, <laughs> movie festival, music, something music festival, he's done posters for those events, and they're just incredible i mean the vivid you, you know you can see from what he's done with our pinball machine but like the vivid colors and the, his take on some of these con concepts and his <clears throat> uh, versions of zombies are um also notorious right yeah. we won't get into the nft thing but um he it just just trust me and, he, and if you have a project i know there's not a ton of people in the room but this is being videotaped so anybody watches this on youtube if you have a major event that you're going to do festival related this is your guy, and he'll make the, uh, an incredible uh, poster for it. He makes uh, the artwork for for, for the expo, show, right? He's yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you got a bright that, that. Already, yeah. The expo poster artwork already sold out. I think they sold out the shirts too. It's nuts. It's great. Yeah, a lot see, of people here. You hire him, and your shirts will sell out for your festival. Um, yeah, I think we'll just turn it on to Q and A. It'd be interesting to see if there's any questions about uh, yeah, the Funhouse project. Questions about the games, the different models, uh, how it came to be, um, Brian's artwork, uh, quality control, other suppliers involved. Um, now's the time to ask. <laughs> Are you uh, producing these? to order or I mean you ha you yeah. have a retail establishment where you know you're going to sell a certain number over time so are you ordering more than you have committed orders right now just to yeah so we have a committed amount with Padre the manufacturer as to how many they're going to make uh, limited edition is limited to uh, s 750 units globally um, we are the master distributor for the US we have three au three authorized sub dealers uh, as well um, who you can buy the game from. So, you know, we're we're getting containers and, and shipments in of games. Uh, we're allocating them across our direct sales orders as well as as well as our sub dealer orders as well. So we that that timeline's been communicated. Uh, production's been, you know, for the most part hitting you know for, uh, pretty good. I'd say about a month or two delayed from what our initial timeline was. But we've we've sold about forty five to sixty so far and shipped in the US. Um, and then probably over in Europe, uh, which is where the er, a lot of the earlier uh, games went, we're probably at uh, over 100 sold uh, through uh, Europe and Australia and Canada as well. But we're, we're focused solely on, uh, you know, sales in the U.S. Um, so one thing I noticed, um, I only played it once downstairs so far, but came into it blind. I haven't read anything about it. I just knew that there was a remake coming out. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the rules were different. I saw that it's a game code 2.0, I think it was ca called. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was very. I can expand on that if you want. Yeah, it was, it was very cool. And yep. I just wanted to comment too. It's almost, 
it's not a remake, it's a reimagination. And I yeah. that's something I haven't seen yet with all these remake games. Yeah, that was always Nick's idea when this whole project, when I first w- was was brought on, is, um, hey, I, I have these remakes, and, you know, you know, CGC did a great job with the remakes on Medieval, Monster Bash, things like that, but there was never really a reimagined version. As Nick noted, the goal was really, you know, in, you know for, for Brian's artwork, the goal and his task was, make Funhouse reimagine in 2024. What would it look like with modern art and what's your take on that? So that's kind of where the limited edition version came to be and that, yeah, this is the first remake to have different artwork and, and the response to that uh, has been very positive, um, you know, obviously with, with Brian's amazing art. Um, but yeah, I mean, he did all new artwork on, on the decals, the play field, even the plastics, inner art, everything uh, was reimagined from an art standpoint. Um, the 2.0 code was something that Pedretti had already had uh, with the uh, with the uh, there's a 2.0 kit so that was sold you know probably two three four years ago was when it was first announced and they probably sold about 500 kits to 2.0 which is basically uh, the option to for original Funhouse owners of the 1990 game to update their board set with the fast pinball board set and um, you know I think the LCD it was a bigger LCD you got the mini LCD display in the game. Uh, but then, more importantly, you have a, a new reimagined, you know, uh, you know, uh, code that that's that, that's the updated 2.0 code. So that's kind of where you know that came from. And then you know, having Pedretti already having that that code there, naturally, it made sense on this project. You know, that we should in- include that on the highest end model um, and no extra charge uh, for that. So that's kind of where the where the 2.0 uh, came along. Um, Pedretti. Uh, so the original 1.0 code is what was what we call it. That's just the base code that we all know and love. That's an option on the game in the settings. You can do the 1.5, which is what the you know it, it ships with the 1.5, uh, which is basically original uh, code that we all know and love. But Funhouse, when it came out, had some 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 you know a lot of limitations that we expect in modern pinball today such as auto plunger, auto launch, doesn't have that on that game. So we they the 1.5 code has that um, ball safe. You know, a lot of people play Funhouse um, growing up and you know, even Adam's family, it's like, you know, I plunge the ball, but now today we're used to ball safe. We drain, you know, we want the ball back if if you have an initial drain. When Funhouse and Adam's family and those games came out, if you if you plunge and drained um, with hitting a switch, you're you lost your ball. So we you know bringing it to more modern feel and stuff. Um, we added the ball save feature uh, into the 1.5, and it can also be added to the 1.0 code too if you really want. Uh, that's an easy setting adjustment. Um, some other good setting adjustments that probably w- that weren't on the original game uh, is coil adjustments. So you know the game ships with uh, you know a certain coil set and, and you know a recommended default settings uh, for the lower and upper flippers. Um, but if, if you know a customer feels like you know my flipper power needs to be higher, there's uh, four or five you know different levels in the coil adjustments that that can add um, to the flipper strength, uh, kickouts, uh, auto plunger, stuff like that. So that's a nice added upgrade as well. Uh, and then the last thing, the 1.5 you, you see on the floor, it's just got in, you know enhanced animations. So it's basically the original game with enhanced animations. Um, it's kind of what what I kind of you know you know always call it. Hopefully that answers your question on the on that side. I'll just expand on that uh, briefly. That you'll see that it says Funhouse Remake on the brochure, and it's going to be widely advertised as Funhouse Remake, and that's was kind of against what my desire would be. And that's why if you look at this, the name of the seminar, it's Funhouse Reimagined. So when I pitched this to Jersey uh, Jersey Jack and Stern as potentially bringing Funhouse back and them manufacturing it, that's how I pitched it to them. Um, Stern was adamantly against remaking games, interestingly. Um, but but um, but I said it's not remaking a game. I'm one, I, it's remaking this theme using the same layout and making it as if it was made today. So you still have the liberties with art and code. Okay. Because the layout, there's nothing wrong with the layout, and Rudy's iconic, so why would you get rid of that feature on the game? Um, so I'm over it. You know, it's it's called it's a, it says remake, and that's fine. But the games that I would like to take on uh, going forward, if I do more projects like this, um, it's to do to do it is to reimagine the game, and I would and absolutely 
involve people like uh, Brian Allen and, and probably exclusively at Brian that he'll always work with us and um, to, to have new code in the game. So, uh, and I think that's not a remake, that's reimagining. And I would do want to make a comment on pricing because I mentioned Medieval Madness coming out uh, 2012, 12 years ago at 79.99. How great a value is! So we are selling fun houses for like eight, nine, ten thousand dollars used. You know, thirty, almost thirty-five year old games leading up into this. So to buy a completely re redone uh, game with the 2.0 code and the original classic artwork for 74.99, I think is underpricing it. Um, so when we speak to how many we expect to sell, I think it's going to be popular. You know, there's a lot of choices that we discussed, but uh, the goal is to get this great classic game in people's hands, but also for the people who do want to see that reimagined version with all that new artwork, is also have it at a price point for a limited edition under 10000 and we've been able to accomplish that. So I think it's a great value. It's a great game. Historically, we haven't changed the game, but uh, bringing it you know, to new life and reimagining it. So I know there's a question in the back. And had problems with it, and I had to, you know, translate and go back and forth with that. What type of warranty is there with the game, and who do I deal with, uh, Pedretti or? Oh, like, so I'm gonna turn this over to Dominic in a second. But when we started the company 18 years ago, and whenever I was on the phone for, you know, 13, 14 years before Dominic really joined the team, people would ask us about why should I buy from you, and what I would say is, call my competitor. And you'll probably have to press one for sales, wait a little bit, finally get a sold to somebody. Call the pinball company, maybe not now since we're all at the show, Brooke might, might answer. But call the pinball company you know, during normal hours, let's say 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. And Dominic or Brooke will answer the phone immediately. You don't have to press anything. It's Brooke, pinball company. I'll be, she'll be making dinner at my house on her cell phone. Brooke, pinball company. Or the phones will be going to Dominic, same thing. And we're like, you know, we know he's taking calls. Um, so when your kids are, at, you have a Super Bowl party uh, or a birthday party, 12-year-old birthday party, and all his friends over want to play the game and it's not working, how important is it for you to be able to reach somebody? Call 1-800-PINBALL. Text me. Uh, which is 1-800-PINBALL yeah, or one, one of our other numbers. I think 1-800-PINBALL still works, but call our number and you'll reach us. And then and a lot of times in the past when I was more integral to the, that side of the business, um, I uh, I would FaceTime with customers on the spot and say, hey, you're on an iPhone? Let's FaceTime. And I would go to a, go to a machine and or go, have them go to the machine and walk it through it. So, but it, it, I would tell him what the warranty is. He, Dominic can tell you what the warranty is. Mechanical, 12 months for the classic, um, six, or 24 months for the LE. Electronic. In other words, like what I want. Yeah, electronics, um, six months, I think, on the classic and 12 months on the LE. And if you buy from the pinball company, the yeah, labor? Normal, yeah, our normal warranty is um, one-year parts, labor for 30 days, lifetime phone support. So, I mean, a lot of times when you're shipping pinball machines nationwide, um, you know, they move around a lot. Things can come loose, stuff like that. Um, most of the time, I can FaceTime with the customer, and they'll, we can get it resolved right away. Um, sometimes we sell to people who, who have no idea, how, how, you know, how to take the glass off a machine. So we have technicians, as Nick said, across the country, um, you know, probably close to 300 now we've used, um, who can go out to people's houses, and we, we cover that call uh, for the first 30 days um, of purchase as well. Uh, you asked kind of, you asked about like parts and warranty, and like kind of getting them how quickly. So Pedretti sent us uh, you know, a, a small batch of, of extra parts that commonly break. Uh, so we have those in my warehouse uh, in St. Louis. Uh, Pedretti is also very responsive to uh, you know any online uh, support questions and tickets. Uh, for example, um, you know hiccups happen. The guy got uh, you, know, you know one of our sub dealers here, Pinball Star, one of their customers got a uh, uh, LE legs uh, powder coat uh, on a classic game. So obviously hiccup at the factory. Uh, it's been taken care of in, in a, yeah seven days, taken care of. Um, so Pedretti is very responsive. They, they've been great to work with. So they're they're, they're on on that side. They're um, they're doing a good job. Um, Rick at Planetary supplies most of the parts for the game. Um, so even if you have an original fun house, you can go to Planetary and they'll probably have, have parts now available, which is great. Um, but, but Rick has a lot of the parts uh, as well. And um, Pedretti has a warehouse uh, associated with you know, all the Pinball Brothers stuff uh, in the US as well. 
so um, you know some parts will ship from there. So really no concern on on getting parts, uh, replacing parts under warranty timely to customers. It's been fine so far. Yep. Thanks again. <laughs> Uh, my question is about shipping from Europe, manufacturing in Europe. Is, mm -hmm. Isn't that a challenge, a problem? Uh, yeah, I mean, manufacturing pinball, no matter where it is, it's going to be a challenge. If you you go into any any factory tour, you'll quickly realize how many parts, how much labor is involved, how much R and D is involved, how much attention to detail is involved. Um, so that's that's no different, no matter where you go. When I visited them in Italy. Um, they have a great understanding and good base knowledge of pinball. Uh, they have been a manufacturing company since, you know, I think the 70s and 80s. Not not always pinball, obviously, but arcades and stuff. So when we were looking at manufacturers and stuff, um, you know, having that manufacturing history is very important. Uh, we, we've seen we've seen in pinball, obviously, even as of as of recently, you know, a lot of a lot of times, uh, you know, we have all these grandiose ideas. These things look amazing, but you know, if you don't have a production and assembly and, and that experience, that that's what ultimately typically harms a lot of these these things. So, um, when I was there, uh, the focus was on quality control. You know, we have some of the best techs in the world. Nathan, over there, Dan, uh, he's he's refurbished 150 fun houses in his career, so he knows that game inside and out. So when when we get it in, we were able to give them immediate feedback. Um, just simple things like, you know, um, the locking mechanism, you know, it's a very important shot in the game, probably the most important shot. Um, but on the original, sometimes it'll, the ball, will, you know, it'll blow through that lock sometimes. So, you know, Nathan's, or all of our games he's done, he adds a, an extra, you know, washer and spring assembly uh, to basically, you know, it, it, it eliminates that problem altogether. So they've made those adjustments, um, you know, from the original Funhouse to this remake. Uh, trap door mech, a very common issue on that, you know, that ramp flap that, that sits there, uh, as it goes up and down over time, that ramp flap will start to bend, look a little bit off, um, you know, an easy fix on that, just adding a, a, you know, um, a metal support bracket underneath there, so like stuff like that's been done. Um, Rick at Planetary is very big on opto switches or for the flippers, um, so he... Um, you know, we, we says that that's that's a lot more reliable than than the the the, the leaf switches on on some some games. So it does have the opto uh, flippers on, on there, and then um, yeah, just from a quality control standpoint, you know, understanding the processes of how you know play fields are built, how you know how the um, you know how they're being um, you know looked over, approved, stuff like that, all the way to the cabinet building, mechanical, all that stuff. Um, there's checklists there that that, that are. You know, being followed. The shipping, the shipping doesn't become expensive. Shipping's yeah, it's expensive. It's all, it's all part of you know the build out of the project and stuff. And um, yeah, but it's, it's nothing, uh, it's nothing crazy. I think if you're if you're choosing to manufacture machines to be sold here in the U.S., it's obviously desirable to have them made here. Um, but early on, we discussed shipping prices with Progetti because they had experience shipping containers of their other games here. And um, when you ship a full container, you're looking at around uh, $250 per game. So relative to the price point, not uh, not incredibly uh, ter terrible and kind of built into our price point. If you're air freighting um, five at a time, you know, you're... Yeah, air, air freighting can get expensive, you know, 500 to 750 depending on how quickly you, you need it here. Yeah, so that um, on a per game basis yeah. doesn't work on the long term, but when we plan on selling through, you know, a thousand machines, say, in the U.S., uh, we hope that most of the machines that get, the prototypes that you see here at the show were air, air, air freighted, I believe, right? Air these, freight, are, yeah. these are production games at the yeah. show. But yeah, oh, uh, air freight yeah. so far, we have paid in full, or sorry, we, we have paid um, our initial deposit um, on the first half container of games. So we're, we are moving to container shipping. So now um, we're at half containers. Forward. So we're getting five at a time yeah. for the show. And we're not, half container. Now we've got a half container like on the way. Yeah. And then we'll hopefully work, really work quickly we'll be doing full containers at a time. And so the cost per unit for the bulk of the games coming to the U.S. are going to be around 200 to $250 per game. So yeah, Pref preferably that would be a factory right here in the U.S. And maybe the next game will be. But for now, you know, it's a cost that we can deal with. Other questions, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I had another question uh, specifically about the art um, when taking on this project. Um, 
what were the conversations in the beginning about the direction of way the art was going to go? And then were there any restrictions with the IP at all in terms of, you know, keeping original at all? Or did they give you like full reign to do whatever you want, go at it? Or how did that kind of come about? Um, they did give me a lot of flexibility. Uh, I, I was required to add a lot of the 2.0 code characters. So if you're unfamiliar with that 2.0 expansion pack, uh, Rudy's Nightmare, mm -hmm. that's a, uh, the, the hot dog character that you, I had to draw him. So he's, he's all over the place. He's, he was fun to draw. Um, and and the, the crazy monkey, also fun to draw. Um, other than that, uh, we, I did have some previous sketches uh, that Pedretti had already approved. But he really did give me free reign. Uh, whenever I approach any of these remakes, it's very challenging because the original artists, many of whom are, are still around, were were masters. You know, the, these all of these pinball machines are are true works of art. So it's really challenging to take something that's already great and then try to figure out how can I inject something new into it. Um, and anytime you try to change something that people are already familiar with, there is the risk of it of people not liking it um or if you don't change it enough it just l looks like a copy so it's sort of a, a delicate balance in that way um so i just tried to uh, my my fail safe is just to jam as much stuff in it as i possibly can which is is what i did and i i also like to inject some easter eggs of other Williams titles, so so I, I dropped in um, like the Ferris wheel is is the Bride of Pinbot's face, and uh, Pinbot is lurking back there. Um, Com Comet is in there. Yeah, the creature. You got to put the creature in there. But uh, you know, I, I strongly encourage everyone to go and, and look at you know the actual translate in good detail. And um, yeah, the Easter eggs in there are are really cool and a uh, good throwback and, and mention of some of these classic uh, other games in, in that Bally Williams era. Yeah, I always loved, like, the Where's Waldo books, you know. I would check those out at the library when I was a kid. So I love just just pumping it. I, I want to, get you know, draw something so that every time you see it, you see something new. You know, that that's the, uh, the goal anyway. But does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, great. Um, it's, it's going to sound so odd, but I love on the play field, I don't know if we get, well, on the play field, there's a, uh, a slide with like, uh, a lady holding a little umbrella going down the slide. And I don't know, that just cracks me up. Like, I, I like drawing stuff where it, if it makes me laugh, then, uh, I know I'm on the right track. Um, but, uh, I, and I love the, uh, I love drawing the monkey, the monkey with the symbols is so much fun to draw. And... And clowns. If I can put in a creepy clown, then I'm I'm pretty happy. And there's there's probably at least eight. <laughs> what's the back oh, yeah. what's the backstory on this woman? I feel like I, in a lot of your art pieces I see I see her. Oh, uh, she just she's my uh imaginary girlfriend, I guess. Okay. <laughs> she, that's my um Yeah, th that was sort of inspired by the theater magic character. Um but I was I was just looking for a way to just like I said build on something that was already a great work of art and then how can I add some more characters and just uh, I forgot I that thought. I was on the I was on the back line. Yeah, yeah yeah that's right yeah Nick yeah Nick is right there eating popcorn <laughs> with his he has a he has a cool like Pac Man suit uh, suit coat I did that <laughs> when when um. When I reached out to Brian, and I think one of your early questions was like, you know, r r alluding to how much leeway you were going to have, like how hard is it going to be working with Nick Parks? And I like basically said, dude, I trust you. Go to his website and look at like Whitewater or Fishtails or just go to his booth and like look at his artwork. When you see his artwork and you say you hired this guy to be your designer, you're not going to like give him any parameters. You're like, you let this guy's brain go to work and let him do it. So I'm so glad that we were able to do that because it wasn't like you're remaking Pirates of the Caribbean and you got to suffice, you know, Disney. It was like 
Funhouse. And it was, you know, it was, it was already a pretty generic theme. And so he gave him, obviously wanted it to be kind of true to the original game in terms of this, those characters and Rudy and, and whatnot. And uh, I think he stuck to the color scheme if you just put them side by side. We have brochures up here, so grab one of each if you want. Um, they'll be collectible someday. <laughs> and I was just Googling, like, pinball flyers. And, like, any pinball flyer is, like, five bucks today. Like, they're all collectibles. But, um, I mean, you just – you can see side by side or go to the booth and see them side by side. And, like, he uh, – I- if my expectations were a 10, he got a 12. He did such a great job, which we're, we just mm-hmm. want to work with him on every pinball project we do if we can, if we can make it work. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question for you. Um, and I apologize oh, for not knowing this, as this is already common knowledge. But how did the engineering process work? Uh, you know, is this built on the fast platform? Uh, yes. So you had the foundation yeah. with what Fedretti already done. Did yeah. So when Nick, you know, we had the Funhouse license, and then we, you know, Fedretti agreed to, to, to take on the project. They did most of the R and D and prototyping of it. Obviously, we have expertise in in online retail sales customer support stuff like that uh, we have amazing techs but we don't have the, the you know who they're, they're working on their own machines for our use use sales uh, so thankfully Pedretti and their team took on the project of you know the prototyping you've seen some of the prototype and that's all done in Italy um, and you know they, they, they took on that uh, relationship working with Aaron at fast pinball uh, the um, what's it called like the the imitation or the integration of the code um, between the original and all that, all that was done by Aaron at Fast and, and then Pedretti. So they, they worked hand in hand, um, kind of behind the scenes. And we were, you know, myself and Travis and Nick, we, we, we would provide our, our feedback um, on art stuff. You know, uh, once we got our prototypes, obviously we were providing feedback on quality control, things that we had seen. Because um, in Italy, you know, they, they um, if you tell them what to do and you know they're very good at manufacturing but this is their first time manufacturing a Valley Williams pinball machine and using those parts so th- things like um, rollover switches that we're all you know know and love for all these games again like, and they're they're used to doing uh, if you look at the alien and queen on the pinball brothers side which is what the, they also help manufacture those it's not it's not that it's not those type of parts so you know knowing and having the Valley Williams parts and stuff was a learning process and you know, small things like, you know, screws should be here. So, you know, the, uh, I think at one point the, um, the coil was mounted, you know, the upside down and, you know, there's, there's better ways to, 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 you know, to mount a coil that we've learned, um, over the years. So things like that was where, you know, the pinball company and, 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 you know, all, all my team, you know, gave that feedback. Um, you know, Nick mentioned, I, I have a competitive background, uh, pinball, uh, Travis, our other marketing guy, and that does our YouTube content, which I, I highly recommend you guys check that out. Um, he's a top 25 player in the world. So, you know, having the, that feedback, um, I think, was hopefully valuable to Pedretti. And, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're in a good spot. and like they're comfortable now with the Valley Williams mechs, the parts, and stuff like that. So I, I, would, I would expect, um, you know, any future projects or games from them to, to kind of utilize those parts that are – are reliable and have been, you know, tested, um, you know, with all these other games over the last 30, 30 to 40 years. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. <laughs> Thank you guys all for coming. Uh, appreciate all your support. Yep.